Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this Nehemiah Bible study. We're delighted that you could join us today as we look at Nehemiah chapter 13. This is the final chapter of the book of Nehemiah. We've been studying this over the course of all of the previous episodes, taking one chapter a week, uh, just studying the word, studying passages from each chapter, helping enrich your personal study. And we're going to do the same today uh, as we bring our study on the book of Nehemiah to a close. We're going to read verses 15 to 22, make some comments about them, but then we're also just going to share some overall reflections on this book as a whole, and we pray it really blesses you. But let's go ahead and read verses 15 to 22. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem, but I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. So if there's one thing we learn from this chapter is that you don't mess with Nehemiah. Um, And it's a fascinating chapter, chapter 13, as we draw this study to a close, because up to this point, we've had a real sense of rebuilding the walls, of reinstituting worship, um, and they've dedicated the walls. They've been getting things organized. It's all been really promising, really moving forward. And in this chapter, it's almost like it goes back a little bit. It regresses mm. a little bit. So we're going to we're gonna study that a bit. Um, but the context of this chapter begins with Nehemiah's return from being at the king's court. So Dr. John, what has gone on here and how does this relate to some of the issues that come up in this chapter? Right. Um, an old proverb, which originates hundreds of years ago from Latin, is when it's translated is, when the cat's away the mice (laughs) (laughs) and although Nehemiah lived a long time before this proverb was written its meaning meaning certainly applied to the situation when Mm. we return to Jerusalem Mm. so things that we were reading here about the desecration of the Sabbath day God had commanded that the Sabbath day were kept holy Mm. and that there was no trading and they'd just gone completely against that Mm. but also other things we read um, in Nehemiah 13, verse 7 and 28, mm. uh, things that made worse, that Eliashib, the high priest, had given Tobiah a room mm-hmm. in the temple courts. Mm-hmm. Now, Tobiah, of course, was one of the people that really opposed yeah. mm-hmm. the, the work yeah. of right. God, and he's given him this nice nice apartment as well, you know, mm. quite a cosy place. People can read about that in the earlier chapters, four, five, six kind of time mm. in Nehemiah, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, uh, and also one of Eliashib's grandsons was Sambalat's son-in-law. Mm-hmm. So the um, basically the grandchild of the high priest mm. had married into a foreign kind of pagan nation. Mm. Um, so there's big issues there. Mm. Um, but really the thing that's coming out here is that the people, they promised all these things mm. and then they've gone back on what they promised. They have this binding agreement mm. and all the rest of it. Mm. Yeah. But once Nehemiah's away, once... Uh, it, he's not there to kind of keep an eye on things mm. Mm. uh it all kind of goes it regresses it kind of yeah. goes back to what it was before and it's very very disappointing mm. it is it certainly is and i mean we don't quite know exactly why nehemiah had to go to the king's court in the first place it just says um you know in verse six he had to ask permission to return which means that maybe he had been recalled by the king or something um but exactly as you say whilst for whatever reason that had 
draw Nehemiah to have to go back to the king. That's the Persian mm-hmm. king. Obviously, this is the time when Israel, they're still, um, you know, the under Persian rule. Um, and so Nehemiah could have been told to go back. But whilst he's away, whatever happens, the people drift yep. and they go back on this binding agreement that will be familiar to people who have read through, have been following the series from chapter 10. Um, and uh, Amy, I'll come to you about this in mm. just a moment. But I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that the way this chapter is written, it's clearly meant to be read as a follow up yeah. to chapter mm. 10 in a sense, you know, 10 verse 39 say, 10 verse 39 says we will not neglect the house of our God mm. and then 13 verse 11 says why is the house of God yeah. neglected yeah so Nehemiah is kind of making mm-hmm. a point for us here um and one of the key things which we've read about in our verses is trading on the Sabbath mm. and so why was that all why was that why is breaking this binding agreement mm. why is that all so significant Well, as you said, we go go back to chapter 10 and we see that they've got this huge revival. You know, they're Mm. passionate about their relationship with God. You know, they want to seek him first. They Mm. enter into this covenant with God Mm. where they agree, you know, certain things. And you can go back and listen to to where we really unpack that. And, Mm. you know, some of that is mentioned. One of them is is the Sabbath. Mm. Um, And that's keeping, you know, the the day that's holy for God, really. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, it's it's a rest day, but it's also about... um, you know, worshiping God. It's Mm. about, um, glorifying God in that day. Mm. Um, but ultimately this was completely ignored. Mm. And I guess, you know, for a lot of people, they, they, who, who were not Christians at the time that they, they, Israelites at the time, they would have looked at that and gone, well, this, this is an an extra day that we can buy and trade. This is, you know, we could get more money this way. So actually they, they kind of lent more towards materialism Mm -hmm. than actually obeying God's law and you know, there's nothing wrong with buying and selling in and of itself, but when it becomes more important than glorifying God, mm. that's where the issue lies. And that's just one of the things that we see the Israelites sort of fall back into. Another one is, again, sort of on the financial front is that they stopped giving. They stopped tithing. And because of this lack of support, the Levites and the singers, they had to go back to work in order to provide themselves. So they weren't able to to lead the people in service again. So That's again, as you mentioned, the verse 11, where it says, you know, Mm. why is the house of of God forsaken there? They begin to sort of turn their backs on God. And it's, um, it's really interesting that the drift has set in, you know, that they've drifted away from this passion that they've had. And it's sort of, yeah, it's really interesting to read because Mm. it shows us how easy it is for drift to set in, Mm. um, you know, then it's this sort of gradual, drift but it can have you know catastrophic Mm. consequences um so i think it's a really important reminder for us to to Mm. stay true to to you know putting god first you know Mm. taking that time to to read the bible Mm. spend time with god and just Mm. yeah really staying on top of that so the drift doesn't set in it's really good you use that word drift and uh so the meaning of that being that almost going from focusing on god and his Mm. priorities putting that first to almost shifting and what we see taking place here is actually people putting their own preferences and Mm. uh, priorities uh, above God's leading the house of God to be neglected they stop they start trading on the Sabbath and they break this this binding uh, agreement here Laulu um, uh, you know what does this tell us about people because I suppose when we look through the book of Nehemiah, it's in Nehemiah chapter nine, they tell the story of God's people and how there was this cycle of uh, drifting away from God. You know, they face the consequences. uh, They turn back to God and God brings them into a good place. And as soon as they're in the good place for a little bit, then they regress again and they turn away from God. And, you know, it almost seems to be this never ending uh, cycle, really. I mean, uh, what, what, what can we take away from, uh, this realization in a practical sense that helps us with our faith today. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, as you mentioned in Nehemiah chapter nine, where, you know, we see the people realize that, you know, actually we have sinned, you know, our ancestors have seen, have sinned so much and we cannot continue in this way. And when you read it at the very start, you think, oh, this is the time where, you know, they are not going to regress anymore, mm. you know, that they are going to... <clears throat> that they are going to now follow in the ways of the Lord and mm-hmm. that actually like, they are not going to, you know, go back to the ways of their ancestors. Mm-hmm. But actually we see once again that the cycle continues and mm-hmm. that, you know, they once again regress and that they once again um, stop following in the ways of the Lord. And so mm-hmm. in a very 
practical manner, I mean, I, I guess we've used the word drift and actually it's really just important to remain steadfast mm-hmm. every single day, you know, in, in our walk and our journey with God. And actually for these people, um, you know, once the battle was won, once the wars were completed, it, it, it was, of course, really important to, re- um, to you know, to dedicate it all to, to, to God, to celebrate, mm-hmm. to have those times of worship. But actually, that's not where the battle ends. So actually, like life continues. Actually, right. things right. continue to go on. And, and fun for us, we we need to remember that there is you know no end point. That actually, it keeps going. And we need to mm-hmm. you know think every single day: how can I you know show each and every day you know mm-hmm. the love that I have for God? And I think when we approach it with this attitude, rather than thinking, oh, you know what, I'm going to, I guess go out on a whim and just mm-hmm. kind of like go with the flow. I think mm-hmm. a, go with, a go with the flow devotional life or, or a go with the flow relationship with God mm-hmm. is always, I guess, susceptible to, Drift. you know, yeah, yeah to yeah, drift. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. when we, you know, realize that actually when we're intentional about this and when we are intentional about, I guess for these people sticking by this binding agreement, because they, they all agreed to this, you know, that there were consequences mm-hmm. um, and actually they just, you know, didn't, you know, I guess, pay much attention to it in the end, you know, over, yeah. over, over, over really, that time. Yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's just really interesting. It's really helpful. And I guess it just highlights how drift just occurs one small bit at a time. Mm. You know, you, yeah. it does so um, see that it, it highlights it was, you know, most likely just one decision at a time, a little bit of trading on yeah. the Sabbath just to um, mm. get their own, you know, personal preferences, their own personal goals mm. moved forward more, or, you know, um, just reducing the tithe mm. a little bit or, you know, and little yeah. by little, they slowly move away from what mm-hmm. they'd agreed to uh, to do for God. Let, uh, mm-hmm. So just just thinking bigger picture here for a moment then. Um, Dr. John, I want to come to you uh, because Nehemiah, it, in, this, in the timeline of the Old Testament, it sits right towards the end of the narrative of what we have in the Bible in the Old Testament. Um, and it is quite a disappointing ending as we've identified. But in a sense, it sets us up brilliant, brilliantly for the coming mm-hmm. of Jesus in the New Testament. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little. Yes, I think um, the thing with, with Nehemiah, the, it's, I, I'm thinking of the, the story, a parable that Jesus told about a king and also another parable, a master going away and leaving his servants and mm. giving them the instructions to what to do. Mm. And in the parable, when Jesus is saying, He's talking about his return mm. to this earth. And Jesus is saying, you don't know when I'm coming back. Mm. Right, right. And he says, what he's saying is, uh, and using this parable, that's important. These servants are doing, when he comes back, mm. that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Mm. Uh, that they're not sleeping. Mm. They're not maltreating the other mm. servants. Mm. Uh, and uh, the number of parables that Jesus taught about this Time. he's coming back again yeah. and it reminds me of a Nehemiah he goes away he comes back you know mm. what does he see yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also as well as thinking to Jesus return in the future we don't know when that will, will be but also I think the message comes out here is that that God sees what we do mm. um, that in a sense it's important when we're in, in church and it's so important to meet corporately and mm. worship mm. God mm. But also, there's the quiet times. There's the mm. times when we're serving God and people aren't noticing. Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking about what Jesus said about the um, the Pharisees. Mm. They were praying in the street, and they, everybody mm. said, "Oh, aren't you good?" Mm. And that's that's fine. But mm. Jesus said about going into your room and, yeah. and praying, yeah. and mm. your Father will see you in secret. Mm. Yeah. And that's not to say we shouldn't pray in church. And I'm mm. not saying that at all. Mm. But I think what the message is coming across. Mm. is that God sees what we do we see mm. in, in, uh, in secret. Mm. And our Christian lives, it's a whole life. Yeah. Mm. It's not just a Sunday, yeah. or the Sabbath, mm. whatever. Mm. And I think what the, the people had done here, and I don't know, Amy was bringing this out, they had drifted away. They originally had good intentions. Yeah, mm. yeah. The good intentions there, but the things in the world kind of, drew them away yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it's so easy to you know, do that thing things actually that could mm. be quite legitimate but mm. they pull you away from god yeah. mm. and okay today we don't really see people bowing down to idols yeah. in the mm. street you know and things yeah. like that but anything that puts god into second place yeah 
is an idol. That's yeah. really helpful. Yeah. It could be a car, it could be whatever. Yeah. Nothing wrong with a car, nothing yeah. wrong with a house. Yeah. But if God is pushed down, mm. then the, the thing above him becomes the idol. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I think just to add on as well, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think it highlights to us that, you know, the law, all these rules, regulations and promises and yeah. covenants, ultimately, they're all powerless to stop us from sinning. Right. You know, it's only by the grace of God that right. we can overcome sin. Mm. You know, Romans 8 verses 3 says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, mm. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. You know, right. ultimately it's by, you know, the, the sacrifice of Jesus mm. that actually, you know, we can be made right with God. Yeah, mm. it's really, really helpful. And I think, I think that's it, isn't it? You know, you kind of see, you look through the story of the Old Testament and even repeated here in Nehemiah, it's almost the cycle of human frailty mm. in a sense, isn't it? And mm. I mean, for me, I kind of read that passage and it just makes me more thankful for Jesus. Yeah. Because absolutely. without him, you know, we, we would all be kidding ourselves if we read that passage and thought that we any any person would behave any differently were we in their mm -hmm. shoes. But thank God for Jesus that he came. And as it says in, uh, uh, as you said from the verse, you know, and even in, in, uh, in other places, you know, God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Mm -hmm. And it is through him that we can uh, have that relationship with God. So, um Hey, there's a whole lot that we have covered uh, throughout this study of Nehemiah. And, you know, we're kind of here now where we're looking back across 13 chapters um, that we've studied. And there's a lot of key themes that come through. Uh, Laulu, just to just to come to you, you know, if you were to uh, almost summarize, you know, looking at the key themes of this book, how would you summarize what this book of Nehemiah is about? Absolutely. I think, I mean, this, uh, I guess, goes to a time when Nehemiah, you know, he was, um, you know, not, um, you know, in Israel at the time. He was, you know, working under um, Persian uh, Persian government who were, um, you know, keeping um, Israel in captivity at the time. But basically, he had this conviction to go back mm -hmm. home and to um, rebuild the walls, mm -hmm. um, you know, around uh, Jerusalem. And so he goes um, back home and then he really gets um, the people to get a sense of unity and, uh, mm -hmm. and they get this done, the walls all get rebuilt and then the people get, get this revitalized sense of praise for God and they get this revitalized sense of, okay, now, um, you know, we are going to um, commit our lives to mm -hmm. God we are going to you know put God first in everything that yeah. we do mm -hmm. and they you know after the wars are completed um, and the wars basically are built to make sure that you know um, Jerusalem is no longer um, I guess um, susceptible to attack from other nations and to make sure that he has a really strong fortress um, and so the people even though they commit their lives um, to God at this time and to really live for him we then see in this final chapter that they end up falling away but actually we see that in the entire um, um, I guess, book of Nehemiah, there's really strong, important themes that we still can't take away. Mm -hmm. For example, in the life of Nehemiah himself, he was a man that was devoted to God. You know, mm -hmm. he put God in right. every single thing. Um, he, he, he put God first in every single thing that he did. You know, prayer to God came first for him. Mm. You know, devotion to God. He made sure that in every situation, whenever he was threatened, mm. that he would put God first and that he would go to God in prayer. And actually, I think, uh, yeah, that's really, a, I guess, a brief summary, but then also really um, important to see that in the life of Nehemiah, that even though the people in the end fell away, that actually Nehemiah was still, I guess, striving to, you know, to do what's right in, in, in God's eyes. You know, we see at the very end, you know, he, he says, um, God, remember me with favor. You know, he right. says, remember, um, I have tried my best to do uh you know to do this work so actually we see a man that's devoted to good and that's something that we cannot apply to, apply to our lives as well today brilliant anything to add anything that you uh mm. find inspiring about the character of nehemiah absolutely i think there's two main traits i think that really stand out for me and that's his mm. obedience and his reliance on god and mm. um, kind of similarly to what laule was saying he was fully obedient to God. He was ready to take risks, mm. um, you know, even asking the king to, to go. I mean, he basically risked execution. That's right. before we even get to the building of the wall and then right. all of the opposition as well. You know, he wasn't distracted. He remained mm. obedient and solely focused on mm. God's plan and his will. I think that's amazing to see how much is accomplished through Nehemiah aligning himself to the will of God. So that's the obedience, but mm. the reliance as well is just incredible, mm. you know his immediate response to so many of these situation was prayer. You know, yeah. his, his heart was burdened for Jerusalem mm. and then he prayed, you know, we see he prayed for, for four months in, in, yeah. in chapter one, which is just amazing. Mm. Um, 
yeah, so he just, he solely he relied on God's strength mm. for these things, not his own. And I believe that that's honestly why he was able to endure mm. everything that he endured was because he was uh, with, withdrawing his strength from God. You know, he, he wouldn't be distracted. He wouldn't be disheartened. He wouldn't be disappointed, mm. but he was going to be focused on what God had called him to do. Brilliant. I think we can summarize really the work that um, Nehemiah has done and also the people of Judah, the work they've done, mm. can be really, I think, summed up in the words of the prophet Isaiah, mm. chapter 26, the first two verses. Now, this prophecy was given about 300 years earlier, mm. around about 740 BC. Mm. And Isaiah wrote, In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Mm. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, mm. the nation that keeps faith. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, I think the only addition I would have to uh, to those ones, I think, would just be, uh, I find it very inspiring, just the theme of Nehemiah's resilience mm. yeah. uh, that permeate, permeates throughout the whole chapter. You know, he faced challenge after challenge, um, you know, to even get back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, uh, then the actual rebuilding of the wall, facing the opposition, then reinstituting worship and helping direct people's hearts towards God and they go away and he's trying to get them back on track. It's challenge after challenge after challenge. But time and time again, Nehemiah, he is resilient to that and he mm. continues to keep on uh, fighting for God, fighting for people and uh, often uh, finding that strength uh, by going to God in prayer as well. Certainly a compelling character uh, for us to study certainly a really helpful book that will uh, really help us in our lives there's a lot of principles that we can apply but also will really help us understand uh, just the word of God in uh, in the whole sweep of scripture as well so we really hope that you've enjoyed this study of the book of Nehemiah and we'll see you next time <laughs>